As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. Welcome to lectionary vlog number 27. This is for the 20th of September. And we are, I'm actually not going to do Exodus today. I know for three weeks in a row I've done Exodus. You, and I promised you last week I wouldn't, but it was very tempting because the Exodus story from Exodus 16 to 15 is the story of manna. And manna literally in, in Hebrew means like mystery food. Uh, we today talk about the mystery meat. And uh, so the raining down from heaven of this mystery food is, it was hard for me to resist. And just to, if you want to try Exodus four weeks in a row, just notice that they could eat all they wanted. Um, the, the supplies of God, we, we have this, the surfeit mindset when God's an abundant God and they're able to eat to their full all they wanted. And I just want to um, just feature that a little bit for you to, um, to think about and maybe kind of play it. Psalm, Psalm 105, 1 to 6, 37 to 45, God opened the rock, water gushed out, flowing like a river into the desert again. The water in surfeit in in abundance in in manifold supply the philippians text for me to live is christ and to die is gain what you can't do with that um, uh, what does it mean to conduct yourself in a man manner worthy of the gospel of jesus christ which is uh, another great passage but we're going to do matthew we're going to do a gospel i promise you we do a gospel so we're going to do uh, we're going to have some semiotics of the Matthew 20, the workers in the vineyard. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I just want to read, read part of it. For the kingdom of heaven is like. Okay. Now notice what Jesus gives us next. A story. We don't get seven principles. We don't get 11 practices. We get a story. The kingdom of heaven is like. A landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Then he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard. Whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why do you stand here all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the first to the last. But when they who were hired about the eleventh hour came, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. But each of them likewise received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, this, These last worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I will give to this last one even as I gave to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? And then comes this classic text. So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are, are chosen. In 1978... I will never forget this. 
I was just starting out um, and a book came out and it rocked my world. Not because the book was so good, but the first three words. It's, it was one of the first self-help books. Now that's an oxymoron, self-help, okay. But it was a book that sold millions, it's still being reproduced today, but I could not get into the book. But I bought a copy because of the first three words. You know, sometimes the first book, first words of a, a book, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, Dickens. Here's the first three words of this book, and I'll never forget it. M. Scott Peck wrote it, the book is called The Road Less Traveled. And here is the first three words. Life is difficult. That's it. But when they, I, you just read, you open up that book and you begin to, the first three words of the book, life is difficult. Whop, whack. I mean, it just kind of said it all for where I was and, and just, in school and trying to, life is difficult. The first three words of today's text, life is unfair. Life is unfair. You cannot call time for a fair catch in the game of life. There's no, life is unfair, time for a fair catch. Life isn't fair. It's just not fair. Well, talk to Job about it. Let's see what he thinks about. Um, and, and it is not fair. And I want to suggest that God isn't fair either, which is what Jesus is trying to communicate here. And we better be glad that God's not fair. Because if God were fair, we'd be all in trouble. But life is not fair. And you just have to... There's certain, you know, light, there's nobody who gets through life that has, doesn't have difficulties. You're always going to have problems. You hope you trade up your problems as you get older, but life is full of problems. Life is difficult. Life is problematic. Life is unfair. I mean, and you all can talk to unfair stories. I mean, I, I was born on a street called Hungry Hill. I mean, uh, I, some people were born with silver spoons in their mouth. Other people were born on hungry hills. I mean, it's not fair. Um, now, Hungry Hill in the U.S. Is, is like Easy Street compared to being born on a main street in Calcutta, or what today is, goes as Kolkata. So why was I born in the U.S. and some people were born in, in India or in Africa? Um, well, I, I was and when I was in high school, um, yeah, we, we had to make our own sandwiches every day. And so many times I played basketball in the afternoon and then in the evening I was in play. So I couldn't even come home for supper. So I had to pack lunch and supper. But we were limited to one slice of bologna per sandwich. Okay. So I packed, I had four white, you know, the generic breads that you can buy, white bread. Wonder bread was too expensive. So five, four. Um, sandwiches, one slice of bologna is what we were limited to. We could have one slice of cheese, but we didn't get the cheese that came in these nice little packages. It was government issue cheese, so I had to cut it, and I wasn't going to cut it. I wasn't going to spend the time with it. So I went to school with one slice bologna sandwiches. My best friend, his name is Michael Schoenberg. His father was a doctor, and he came to school with inch thick pastrami corned beef. And of course at school, everybody goes, what you got? Because everybody wants to trade. Nobody wanted to trade with me. Never did anybody say, oh, give me one of your one slice bologna sandwich. And I learned very early in my life that life is not fair. I, I went, my, this Michael Schoenberg, my, he became my best friend and he invited me to bar mitzvah and his bar mitzvah. And first time in my life, I saw an ice sculpture. First time in my life, I saw shrimp, fresh shrimp. I'd never seen it before. First time in my life, I saw lobster. First time in my life, I went to a dance. I don't think my mother knew they were going to dance or she would have let me go to this bar mitzvah. But, I mean, and I realized then, life is not fair. I've gone my whole, my whole life, 12, 13 years, and never had shrimp or lobster. 
uh, or even I didn't go dancing then, but just to be able to, to dance. Life is not fair. My father died at one month before I, gradu I graduated from seminary. So my mother asked if I would do the funeral. It was my first funeral. I said, Ma, I, I really don't think I can do it. She said, I really need you to do this funeral for your father. So my first funeral that I ever officiated at was my father. Life is not fair. Why should I have to, to do that? I mean, looking back of me, looking back of me, I mean, today we are smelling. In fact, we're, we, we're not supposed to be out here. It smells like a paper mill here because we are in the midst of the, the residue of these West Coast fires, some of the worst fires in history. The U.S. have happened this year. And anybody want to live 2020 over again? I mean, talk about the nightmare year. I mean, historians are now debating what are the worst years in history. And, and the top three, 2020, is already, we, we've got like, what, four or five months to go? We've already, they're already saying it's in the top, it's in the top three. Um, it's not the worst. 536 was the worst. A volcanic eruption in, in Iceland created a cloud so large that it totally darkened all of Western Europe and, and uh, Asia for 18 months. Temperatures dropped, snow fell in the summer, famines, millions died, um, had insult to injury. Uh, historians believe that the changes that came about were the ones that created the bubonic plague that killed millions. So it could have been worse, 536. But 2020, I mean, we start out with toilet paper panic buying, and then, then we go to, to COVID. And then, I mean, uh, you know, washing and sanitizing your groceries. I mean, you bring them back from the grocery and you got to wash them. Are you, what, what, have, what has happened this year? Um, you know, Zoom funerals? I mean, it's one thing to teach on Zoom, but you do funerals on Zoom? And I'm not even talking about the worst presidential election in the history of the planet, I think. Um, so, and he, where you're going to be able to tell your grandchildren, I lived through 2020, but they didn't, they're not going to have to. I mean, life isn't fair. And life isn't fair that you can do things that I can't do. I mean, we all have different gifts and you can go places that I, I can't go. And we all have different limitations. I don't believe there are limits, but there are limitations. We all have different limitations. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not tempted at all by alcohol. So I'm, I'm the person you want in a bar ministry. But when a, a group asked me to speak in, at a convention, it was a Seventh-day Adventist convention in Las Vegas, I had to ask a friend, you got to stay with me every single second. Because I... I, if I ever started playing those one-armed bandits, even once, I'm not sure I'd ever leave. I, so I don't even, I'm total abstinence about any, I've never bought a lottery ticket. I never will because I, I don't know what it would do to me because you can buy lottery tickets. I can't. I mean, we all, life isn't fair. I mean, I'm never going to get rich because I'm never going to, no, life isn't fair. And we just need to stop right there. Life is not fair. God isn't fair. It, if you think about how God isn't fair, just think about the first convert in heaven. Talk about the 11th hour. I mean, here's somebody who all his life was a robber, thief, I think he was a pirate. That's a whole other story. And at, the only thing he does good in his life is, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You're there. <laughs> what did he do? Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The first convert in heaven is a convict. Life isn't fair. Jesus isn't fair. Um, I mean, look at who he picks to be on his team. He's got three years in which to save the world, and he does it. He invests in a team. He doesn't build a megachurch, doesn't start a movement, doesn't write a book, doesn't write another testament. He, he just invests in a team, and he picks the best and the brightest. Are you kidding me? Why does he need four fishermen? Four. They're, all, they're redundant. Hey, why didn't he just pick one? And then he's got the, the very opposite end. He's got Matthew, the tax collector, um, 
who, who's, who's hated because they're corrupt. And then he, he gets, you know, Simon the Zealot, who kills the, the Zealots. And then maybe Judas was a Sicari. They're the ones with that. I mean, he, he's, not, he's not picking. Why didn't he pick on merit? He didn't go and say, okay, I'm going to pick the, I'm, I'm going to do a, a, a job interview and just pick out the best. No. He goes out and, you know, you didn't choose me. I'm going to choose you and I'm going to choose the least likely, the least um, promising. And he entrusts his whole mission to this motley crew of misfits and malcontents and the disciples. I mean, life isn't fair. Jesus isn't fair. Um, and we ought to be grateful that he isn't. Because the two most shocking teachings of Jesus, now all of Jesus' teachings you can find in, in Judaism. But Jesus just takes the best of Judaism and, and, and ramps it up and kind of re-enchants it and raptures it. And the two most shocking of his ideas Number one, nonviolence. I mean, this is a culture in Jesus' day where all, everything is solved by violence. Everything is solved by, and Jesus presents another alternative. And even violence to animals is missing. I mean, Christianity is the one religion in the ancient world that is not practicing any kind of animal sacrifice. Everybody else is doing it, and Jesus stops it. So it, the, the teaching of nonviolence, shocking. We haven't even understood how shocking it is. But the second one is grace. Grace literally means undeserved favor, unmerited uh, gifts. Um, Psalm 103 Again, it's there. Grace is there in the Hebrew Scriptures. God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. In other words, you can't apply our categories to God because we are finite. God is infinite. We can't even understand something that has no beginning and no end because we all have a beginning and we have an end. We have a birth and we have that. Nobody gets out of life alive. So we have beginnings and endings. God has no, God, we, so we can't even understand. So, so our categories collapse. So we cannot, you can't impose ca concepts like fairness on God. But thank God, God isn't fair. Thank God, I don't get what I deserve. But God is merciful. We receive Mercy, which isn't fair. The wages of sin is death. Romans 8, 23. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life. When you're brought to justice, bring somebody to justice, you get what you deserve. But when you're brought to Jesus, you get what you don't deserve. You get an excess of love and forgiveness that is beyond what you earned or deserved. You get an outpouring of mercy. How many times do I have to forgive? Seven times seven. Endless forgiveness. Endless love. Can any life stand up before the scrutiny of God and say, at Judgment Day, give me justice? If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? Psalm 130. O Lord, have mercy upon me. Let your mercy fall, O God. Your mercy never fails. I think these are some of the four most powerful words in English language. God's love endures forever. And it's not a fair love. That's why I want to end with Micah 6.8. I love this passage. I mean, everybody loves this passage, but let's get it right. We're not reading it right. Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require of us? What is God expecting of us? And in many ways, this is the summation of Jesus' ministry. What does God expect of us? Do justly. All right, I want you to hear that. Do justly. 
love mercy. Doesn't say love justice. <laughs> you know, you don't really want to love justice, you know, because one day you're not going to say, give me justice. You can say, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. So, no. Do justly. When you are confronted with injustice, do justly. Now, that's, it's justly. I mean, Augustine said about time, I think I know what it is until I try and describe it, and then I have no idea what it is. Every single philosopher in history who has ever studied justice, this is what they end up with. Even people who have divided and dedicated their entire life. The grandson of Jonathan Edwards, a philosopher, he divided and dedicated his whole life. What is justice? He goes, I, I can tell you what injustice is, but I can't tell you what justice is. So, you know, when you're confronted with injustice, do justly. But love mercy. And here's the third one. Walk humbly. Walk humbly. Jesus didn't hate anyone, but he couldn't tolerate that sanctified smug spirits of self-righteousness and holier-than-thou superiority that presume to pronounce judgment, throw thunderbolts on others, and placard justice everywhere they went. It's the humble walk. It's the humble walk that means everything. Um, the only one who could ever speak the name of Yahweh was the high priest. Now, we have the idea that the name was never to be spoken. That's not true. There was one, one day a year, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, when he entered the Holy of Holies, and he sprinkled blood on the centerpiece of the Ark of the Covenant. Do you know what it was called? The Mercy Seat. The Mercy Seat. That's where the Divine Presence was. It was on the Mercy Seat. And the name of God, Yahweh, was spoken as the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. The holiest experience, T-H-E, the holy experience, the holiest, the holiest moment in Hebrew history is when you spoke the name of God, but only as blood was being sprinkled on the mercy seat. Jesus, all of his teachings, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. This is the heart of the gospel. This is the essence of, of who Jesus is and a God of, of mercy. Thomas Aquinas said, divine power has its chief manifestation in divine mercy. The greatest power of God is in God's mercy. A God who isn't just, but merciful. So, Psalm 37, trust in the Lord and do good. God is good, trust in God. God is merciful, trust God. God is love, trust God. God is isn't fair. Thank God. Semiotics is the art of angling, of turning things askew, upside down, inside out, cattywampus, sunny side up, over easy, scrambled, hard boiled. We hope you enjoyed today's journey, but always remember it's more important you prepare the preacher than you prepare the sermon. <laughs>